So welcome. Uh, my name is Peter Fever, and I'm the uh, director of the American Grand Strategy Program here. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Dave and Kay Phillips Family International Lecture Series. And this is our highlight of the, the semester. This is the program that brings our most distinguished visitors to campus. And we have a special one for you today. But I want to thank uh, the Phillips family for their generosity in making this possible. And while I have your attention, I want to let you know that we have one more high level uh, visitor coming. This time, she'll be coming by webinar, but Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, who's the UN, US Ambassador to the United Nations, she'll be speaking at five o'clock on Monday by webinar. You have to uh, sign up on our AGS webpage. If you have not signed up on AGS webpage, please do that now to get our regular serve and find about all of the folks that are coming. But of course, you found out about this event and you were wise to do so because Ambassador Tai is the 19th US trade representative, a sworn in in March, 2021. And she's a member of President Biden's cabinet. She is the principal trade advisor to the president, the principal negotiator, and the principal spokesperson on US trade policy, an enormously important portfolio, as you know. Prior to uh, joining the administration, she had a distinguished career of public service, uh, working on as a, a litigator and also working on um, the congressional side of the House. So she has seen sausage made from both sides, and then she's litigated the sausage before the World <laughs> Trade Organization, and probably sausage exactly, uh, not just <laughs> metaphorically. Uh, she uh, has a Bachelor of Arts uh, in history from Yale, no one's perfect, uh, and a JD from Harvard Law School, uh, and she's a, a wonderful national treasure. And of, to bring to talk to someone that great, we had to bring out our heavy artillery, and so we brought out Professor Eddie Molesky, who is uh, one of Duke's most distinguished professors, but also an expert on political economy, and particularly the relationship between uh, foreign and domestic businesses as they navigate a difficult trade relationship with a special focus on Southeast Asia. Although he does not feature it in his official biography, his most important uh, bio note is that he was head teaching assistant for the intro to IR class here at Duke back when he was a graduate student. So those of you who have suffered intro to IR, there is a future that might be on this <laughs> stage. With that, I will say welcome to Duke, Ambassador Tai and Eddie, take it away. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I'm so excited to play the role of Peter Fever up here and asking the questions. I'll, I'll see if I can live up to his, um, to his talent. Um, Ambassador Tai, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I understand your complex trade schedule. I looked at your schedule online, Kenya, Germany, Cambodia, Indonesia, Czech Republic. So um, we are so grateful you can make time for us. So um, before we jump into the details, I, I thought we could reflect a few minutes on your distinguished career as a public servant that Peter talked about. What led you into public service when other financially lucrative careers beckoned? And what advice do you have for the talented Duke students in the audience who might seek to follow in your footsteps? Well, um, first, let me um, thank all of you for hosting me here. Um, and uh, I, I see friends in the audience and uh, just say that it's really um, an honor to be here with you. Uh, I go a lot of places um, and they, a lot of them sound super fancy, <laughs> um, but my favorite trips are the ones that I take around the United States. And um, my uh, favorite interlocutors um, are uh, students in particular. Um, I feel like when I'm engaging with um, our students and also students abroad, uh, that really I'm having a conversation with our future. <laughs> And uh, the open-mindedness and the intellectual curiosity uh, in the conversations, they challenge me to be better, uh, to think more sharply. And um, uh, it's really uh, a privilege for me to be here with you. To your question about uh, public service, and I, I have spent a significant amount of my time um, working for the US government. Um, let me start with, uh, I grew up in the suburbs um, outside of Washington DC in Maryland because um, I am a second generation um, federal government uh, employee. Uh, my parents uh, were uh, scientists uh, working, uh, my mother still works for the National Institutes of Health. 
Um, and uh, my rebellion was uh, that I did not go into the sciences, uh, but I ended up working for the same employer, which is um, Uncle Sam. <laughs> um, the reason why I've ended up here in a number of different um, jobs uh, is that uh, I found in this um, uh, public service sector, a sense of purpose in uh, my work uh, that I've not found in uh, my work in other places. Uh, and even when I did have jobs that were more financially lucrative, I found that um, that sense of being lost and um, not really uh, feeling connected with the purpose of my work um, generally meant that uh, whatever extra money I was making, I would spend in retail therapy. So uh, I think that, you know, as a financial matter, I think I still come out about net even. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it is, um, it, it is a, just a tremendous honor uh, to be working for the United States government on um, uh, uh, projects, initiatives, on a mission that is meant to um, advance the interests of this country to build out the economy and to create opportunities for Americans. That's great. Um, so just a couple more quick biographical questions. So you are only one of two Asian American and Pacific Islander members of the Biden cabinet um, and a poignant symbol and role model for many young Asian Americans, including my own daughter, Mai. Um, so how did you feel at the moment of that historic appointment? So um, quick update, we now have three. Okay. <laughs> the, the new head of the Office of uh, Science and Technology Policy, uh, Dr. Prabhakar, uh, is um, also uh, an Asian American. Um, how did it feel? Uh, again, I think that in terms of um, serving in um, President Biden's cabinet, um, uh, every time we have a cabinet meeting um, and uh, there is that cabinet room in the White House where you sit at that very, very long table and you have your assigned seat um, around that table, um, every time we convene, um, there are moments where I just sit there and I think, I cannot believe I am here. What an incredible honor and privilege it is to be able to have a seat at this table, to be in this room. Um, and I think that there's a special um, aspect to the particular job that I hold. I think that it's probably the only one I'm qualified to serve in, um, being someone who has dedicated um, almost 20 years now to uh, trade, trade law, trade policy, trade politics. Um, but uh, more so, if you look at my title, I am the United States Trade Representative. And uh, I've had I've had people, um, you know, adults, curious people, also little kids ask me, um, oh, ambassador, um, uh, where are you ambassador to? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, I am actually an ambassador to the rest of the world. Um, and I represent the United States. I'm the trade ambassador. And if you think about my story, um, I am the daughter of first generation immigrants. I am the first American in my family. I was born in Connecticut in 1974. And it wasn't until later that um, when I was filling out security clearance documents, uh, I had to go track down my parents' naturalization papers. And I finally put the dates together and realized that um, um, my parents were naturalized uh, after I was born. So that made me the first American in my family. And today I'm tremendously proud of that. Um, but, uh, you know, whether it's in my domestic travels or in my international travels, showing up and saying to people, I am the U.S. trade representative, I think is an incredible um, uh, demonstration uh, of um, uh, the opportunity that is here in the United States uh, for Americans, new Americans, Americans who have been here for generations um, to play on the team. Do you think that, you know, as an Asian American, you have unique perspectives and experiences, you know, being bilingual, seeing the world through the lens of your parents that have enhanced your ability to accomplish your goals? I think that um, um, those particular qualities, uh, it has occurred to me that growing up bilingual, um, essentially bicultural, right? Um, Again, later in life, I look, I've looked back on uh, how I've grown up and discovered that um, a, a lot of my friends uh, in elementary school and uh, um, you know, middle school, high school, and even into college and even to today, um, that there, is a, there are very easy friendships that I have uh, developed with um, 
uh, other uh, children of immigrants or um, uh, people who are immigrants themselves. And I think a lot of that comes from this uh, bicultural background where um, every single day, especially as you're growing up, uh, you're navigating, traveling a bridge between two sets of languages, two sets of uh, cultural expectations, um, uh, to um, two different types of cuisine. Uh, and you're constantly in the mode of um, translating and interpreting. And I think that in the job that I have now as US trade representative, again, whether it is out there in the rest of the world or here connecting with different communities in the United States, those set of skills of um, uh, listening, processing and translating are useful every single day. All right, so you've had enormously busy, challenging, but ultimately I'd say very successful two years in office. You've negotiated the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, so IPEF, the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, APAP. Um, you've sought broad WTO reforms. I, 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 as I'm writing all this down, I always like, I sometimes feel that you can measure the success of a US trade rep by how many Scrabble letters are left on the board at the end. Like, so I, think, <laughs> I think you're still missing a Q, yeah. Um, so you've worked hard to promote sustainable environmental practices and decarbonization, decarbonization and trade policy, um, enforce existing agreements, improve the resilience of supply chains, eradicate forced labor in supply chains, deal with COVID-19. So what would you say has been your most important accomplishment thus far? Wow. You can only name one. Yeah. This one's hard, right? Uh, yeah, no, yeah, it, it's I hard. also yeah. feel like it's a trick question. So when I'm looking at these questions, I, you know, well, no, it's I, a choose your own adventure. Let me know what I need to ask next. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me let me say one thing. Um, I'm going to give you the answer in this form, mm -hmm. uh, which is the the question that you've asked me is, is really challenging because you're asking me to identify one thing after you've listed a whole bunch of things. Right? <laughs> um, and um, we encounter this challenge all the time, and and definitely in trade. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, I would say that um, uh, the accomplishment that I'm most proud of is the way in which I and my team um, and the entire US Trade Representative's Office um, find ways to thread the needle when we are presented with impossible problems. Like this question is a bit impossible. <laughs> Um, but uh, there are so many of these particular exercises and, and other ones where um, often you're presented with um, uh, a dilemma. You know, um, either, um, uh, either you decide in favor of party A uh, mm -hmm. or party B. Mm -hmm. um, you decide to initiate an investigation or you don't. Um, and I think that, again, my instinct is always to push back on those types of dichotomies, I find more often than not, they are false. And more often than not, the best answer lies in that creative space that is outside of the box that you are given. And um, that I think is especially important in the context of the um, global economy that we are in, uh, which is one that is uh, heavily disrupted. There are high levels of uncertainty and anxiety and I think that you know every single day, um, the spirit uh, within the Biden administration at USDR is we have to push ourselves and others to think outside the box. There may be tools that we have that are traditional that we can use in different and new ways. And then there may be completely new tools that we don't have yet that we need to develop in order to meet the challenges that we're meeting today because this is a combination of challenges um, uh, that um, there are so many challenges and they are layered on top of each other. I think that um, the right answer is going to come in that creative space outside the box. I love that answer. I love the answer of like the, the, the major accomplishment and what makes the job most fun is thinking about the creative ways to solve problems, to thread the needle. All right. So I want to dig into the nuts and bolts of trade policy now. So, um, so first of all, do you think it's too late to trade Elon Musk to another country and still get a high value return? Sorry, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> so um, a pillar of the Biden administration trade policy has been advancing a worker-centered trade policy, which you've defined um, in a speech as working with our trade partners to support workers' rights and stop the global race to the bottom. So 
how have you pursued this goal in practice? And can you give concrete, concrete examples of achievements that you've made in this area? Sure. Um, you know, one of the uh, greatest exercises that I have encountered in this uh, job is um, elaborating on what we mean by worker centered trade policy. Uh, it's a combination of words that is quite unusual. I don't think anyone has ever quite mm, described their goal in trade policy as um, developing one that, that's worker centered. Uh, but that is the point. And, you know, another way of coming at it is um, as we develop U.S. trade policy, um, how do we keep in our minds that whole point of this exercise, the whole point of engaging with other countries, formulating policies is to better the lives, create more opportunities for our people. Oftentimes when we talk about economic policy and um, even international relations, um, you're kind of thinking are you're you're thinking on a macro level, right? Um, I mean, you know, the center is known as the one for grand strategy. Right. It's it's abstract. It's very intellectual, um, and our goal is to bring it back down uh, to the acceptance and the recognition that um, our economy is comprised of human beings. Uh, and um, uh, let that guide our decision making, uh, which requires us to um, uh, to bring a different approach. So I think that um, you know a longstanding critique of um, our trade policy, um, the the version of globalization that we have pursued internationally for the past many decades, uh, is that it is one that has been tremendously responsive to um, large corporate interests. <laughs> Um, uh, to those big kind of, you know, macro components of our economy and, and has lost track of um, uh, benefits to our people. Um, I'll give you an example, um, a concrete example of uh, what we mean by worker-centered trade policy. Um, I'd like to bring it back to the renegotiated NAFTA. So NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Agreement, it's the US and Canada plus Mexico. Uh, it was started, um, that negotiation by the, the George H.W. Bush administration. And then it was uh, finally uh, pushed across the finish line by the Clinton administration. So it's got a bipartisan origin story. Um, it was tremendously unpopular in certain parts of the country and with certain segments of our stakeholders. Um, especially for um, our industrial heartland. Um, the deindustrialization that we experienced as a country uh, was very heavily associated with um, what um, uh, the early um, uh, skeptics and objectors to NAFTA articulated, which is that um, linking together the US and Canadian economies with the Mexican economy, with its uh, lower um, cost structure on labor, its lower uh, protections in the environment, um, would uh, lead to an erosion of those types of standards uh, for our own workers and for our own environment. Um, and I think that over time, um, many of those uh, opponents and skeptics felt that um, they were very validated by the experience that we had. The criticisms and the concerns around NAFTA were bipartisan. <clears throat> and uh, you may have actually heard um, uh, uh, Secretary Clinton, um, before she was Secretary Clinton, um, talk about on the campaign trail, renegotiating NAFTA. Um, you may have heard uh, uh, President, Biden, uh, President Obama, when he was on the campaign trail, talk about renegotiating NAFTA. And I know you definitely heard President Trump when he was on the campaign trail talk about renegotiating the NAFTA. So when the actual renegotiation of the NAFTA came, um, there was at the very end of it, uh, first a rebranding, the new agreement as the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, and then a renegotiation even of that between two very unlikely mm, partners, Congressional Democrats and the Trump administration. And these two partners um, certainly did not see eye to eye on very much, but in terms of the project of improving the NAFTA, improving the USMCA to make it uh, worker centered and worker forward, that is something we managed to accomplish. And so I just draw to all of your attention when the USMCA came to um, the US Congress for a vote, uh, it secured 89% uh, support in the House 89% support, support in the Senate. Those are levels of support that we haven't seen in decades, that it came out of a bipartisan effort. And 
through this um, specific labor uh, rapid response mechanism that was critical to securing that support, we have now in our administration uh, initiated six instances where using a mechanism in a trade agreement that uh, came from one that was traditionally associated with being worker unfriendly, using that mechanism, we have managed to help workers in Mexico at six different facilities secure the right to vote for a truly independent union in Mexico, who has then been able to secure better wages and better benefits for those workers. And this, I think, is critical to um, uh, flipping the narrative of trade on its head, that trade isn't inherently hostile to the interests of workers or the environment. But the challenge for us to, is to figure out how to do trade in a way that actually raises standards and creates that race field. I'm really glad. So that's a that's a fantastic answer. I'm really glad that you brought up the USMCA because it, it was you played such an important role in it in your previous position in in Congress. Um, so, but I I read last week and I wanted to talk to you about it because I thought this was fascinating and I thought you would be the one person who would have real insight into this. So you met with the Me Mexican Secretary of the Economy last week, and it seems to me that there is increasing worries. Um, in the American business community that Mexico is planning to renationalize the energy sector through constitutional provisions that allow state control over energy companies, energy structure. And so I, I, you know, given that you were on the phone or in a virtual conference with the secretary of the economy, I want, you know, your opinions on that. Is this something that we should really worry about? And if it is, is it something that can be addressed through the dispute settlement mechanisms of the USMCA? So there is an inherent tension in um, uh, globalization around um, uh, the rules-based order that we create and the disciplines that it places on um, policymakers um, and um, you know sovereign policymaking and decision making. Um, by entering into these trade agreements, uh, we are um, disciplining ourselves and each other. Um, I think. The way you've described the particular challenges with the energy sector and President Lopez Obrador's uh, policies um, is, a, is a fair characterization of what is at stake. Um, in terms of the USMCA's role in addressing US and Canadian concerns, uh, because we both have concerns with these policies, um, I very much hope and expect that uh, the USMCA um, will play a role in helping us to figure out uh, how to address these concerns and um, uh, uh, find um, accommodations and fixes um, to a fundamental challenge that has uh, come up in our um, integrated economic relations. Just to pin this down a little bit from more for the students, what would be the mechanism that you would prefer to use? Well, so, um, you know, a big part of the uh, renegotiation of the NAFTA and of the USMCA was to ensure that this agreement would have um, uh, enforceability mechanisms. The, the labor mechanism I described earlier uh, can be seen as an enforcement accountability mechanism. Uh, the standard mechanism is something, um, you know, the formation of a dispute settlement panel. Um, this is actually my background. I grew up in trade as a trade litigator um, uh, in the WTO context in particular. Um, you got to think about it and break it down into its component words. Um, a dispute settlement mechanism is there to help you to settle your disputes. And where we are with Mexico right now is that um, uh, a couple months ago, uh, we formally requested consultations uh, with Mexico, uh, and there is a, um, a prescribed process uh, for working through the areas of tension uh, that arise inevitably um, in any trade relationship, and especially one that's governed by a trade agreement. So um, it's the mechanisms that are in the USMCA that we're going to be testing to see how constructively they can help us to resolve this dispute. This will be a fascinating experiment. Yeah, that's it will be great to see. Um, all right, so I'm going to swing wildly because I am a Southeast Asian specialist. So yeah, so uh, so I'm um, and I I want to talk a little bit about the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, um, launched on May 23rd, 2022. That's what people in my neck of the woods are talking about. So the framework includes 12 countries, including the U.S., and will focus on supply chain resilience, 
clean energy, decarbonization, infrastructure, tax, and anti-corruption. Um, so you've been clear in public statements that this structure will be different from traditional trade agreements. Um, and I, I wanna dig into that a little bit, what that means. So how, how exactly does it differ from traditional trade agreements? And why do you think that pivot's necessary? Like why, why is it necessary to pursue that? And then I guess a third one, that, and I'm gonna make sure that you don't throw the water ball at me when I ask, but, but I have to ask this as a Vietnam specialist. So do you see this framework as a replacement to the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, negotiated by the Obama administration and that the Trump administration withdrew us from? This is how I know that you're a professor. You just basically given me a three-part essay question. <laughs> and I, I'm up here I'm up here with that pencil and paper. So I, I, don't know. I think I have a holistic way of, uh, of yeah. responding. Uh, one aspect of the way you've asked the question. So, uh, and this will go to how is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework different from the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Yeah. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was uh, an agreement uh, between 12 countries. Um, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, we've actually got 14. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, so that's one. Yeah, okay. Um, that's a big one. Uh, it is not designed as a traditional free trade agreement, whereas the Trans-Pacific Partnership very much was that. Um, uh, the way that you have presented, um, you know, the, the, the framework itself, uh, I think um, says a lot about how it's not a traditional free trade agreement. So traditional free trade agreement, you know, multiple chapters, the way we do them, almost 30 chapters. Uh, there's a whole set of uh, tariff liberalization schedules where, um, you know, you push your tariffs down to zero or, uh, you know, try to do it immediately. And if you can't do it immediately, you schedule uh, how they do go down over time. Um, and that's actually traditionally not been um, the, the really jazzy part of our traditional FTA negotiations. The tradition, the, the more jazzy parts have been all the other rules chapters. <clears throat> um, and um, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations took multiple years. Um, I can't remember exactly when we would consider the beginning, uh, but I think that it took at least three or four years to build out um, fully and, and to bring to conclusion and signature. Um, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is the um, economic engagement program that we as the United States are bringing back to the Indo-Pacific um, region. Uh, we've got 14 partners. Uh, it is designed to be um, a collaboration between a set of advanced economies and developing economies in this region. So that part is similar. Um, instead of just being a trade agreement, our engagements include trade. Trade is the first pillar, but we have three additional pillars that are economically meaningful, but not traditionally trade. Uh, supply chains, as you said, uh, decarbonization and infrastructure, and then tax and anti-corruption. Um, this is meant to be responsive and relevant to the particular challenges that we're facing in the global economy right now. And uh, in my um, uh, interactions with my counterparts, especially in the Indo-Pacific region, but actually I think this is quite universal right now as we are going through um, significant supply chain disruptions, um, as we are going through um, a, a global um, uh, set of um, inflationary um, uh, dynamics, uh, as we are in, encountering uh, the uh, economic impacts of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, what I hear, oh, and as we as as we confront uh, the urgency of a climate crisis, and also the anxieties that come with the digital transformations of our economy, so all of these different uh, kinds of challenges layered on top of each other. What I hear consistently, both in our own conversations here at home, but also with my counterparts, is the desire to engage economically, to work together, to promote sustainability, resilience and also inclusion, the real anxiety around as, um, uh, as we continue to go through these disruptions, how do those who were already behind not fall further behind? And that's within our own economies, but also in the, the world economy writ large. Uh, how do we incentivize firm behavior, not just to um, maximize efficiency and minimize costs, but to behave in ways that are going to also um, take into consideration the need for resilience and to manage risk. And then on the sustainability side, um, uh, 
how, how do we build out a program uh, that actually builds out our future? Um, so uh, I think that in all of those ways, <clears throat> what we are doing right now is designed to be something uh, where we can deliver results more quickly along the way in these four different pillars. Um, and in service of these three larger goals of resilience, sustainability, and inclusion, I think our traditional free trade agreement structure um, really prioritized uh, trade liberalization and the increase of trade um, without reference to these um, larger goals. And I think that those are all of the ways in which what we are trying to do with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is different from what we had done in the past and um, uh, the reason why it is so important for us to do now. So, so that, that's a great answer and it's really helpful. So, um, just to push a little bit on this. So when, when I do remember when the trade Trans-Pacific Partnership was negotiated, it was this sort of complex agreement that it had labor chapters and environmental chapters. And it was really fascinating to see like how you negotiate on such a multi-dimensional landscape, right? And so, and the, um, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is even expands the number of dimensions. And then, so I guess for you, like to give us a, a sense of like, how you see the world as a negotiator and litigator, does that multidimensionality make it easier or harder for you to accomplish your ultimate goals? I think that um, everything we do is multidimensional. And I think that's part of the earlier answer I gave you, which is, you know, when presented with a yes, no option, an on off option, uh, we're constantly push pushing ourselves to find the solution outside of the, those types of restrictions. And, and I think that, you know, that is very much about taking something that feels two dimensional and creating that those multiple dimensions um, in a negotiation, um, especially uh, one around economic engagement. Um, you are always dealing with multiple dimensions. Um, and um, uh, I, I guess what I would say is uh, this is another version of um, uh, what we've done before, but where we are trying to adapt to being as relevant and responsive as possible to pressures that we're all facing. If I can revisit my answer to the previous question, you know, I think it was implied in what I said, but I didn't really call it out, which is uh, one of the other where areas in which the Indo-Pacific economic framework is different from the traditional free trade agreement is that uh, we are explicitly not addressing uh, tariff reductions uh, and tariff liberalization right now. And again, uh, that is out of um, a focus on um, uh, promoting and incentivizing resilience. So, so I'm gonna, I'd, lo I'd love to talk more about the role that you're playing in the anti-corruption negotiations are playing in this, but I'll, I have, there's, I think there's bigger issues that I'll just move on to, but maybe we can come back to it. So I, I do feel like I need to, you know, to ask you about China, right? Yeah. So, and um, and I'll give some context. My answer, my question for you is more straightforward, but I want to give some context for the audience that, you know, under the Trump administration, the U.S. had pursued a somewhat adversarial relationship with China, exemplified by tariffs on over $50 billion in Chinese goods. Um, economists have found that those tariffs, as well as China's retaliatory tariffs, likely hurt U.S. growth and raise costs for American consumers. But to date, the Biden administration has relaxed some of those tariffs, but kept most of them in place and even allowed hundreds of tariff exclusions approved under the Trump administration to expire, reinstating only 352 of them. So I noticed that the public comment period for reconsidering these negotiations and these tariff exemptions, exclusions, will open um, in six days on November 15th. And so I, I was curious, so given your extensive conversations that you've been having as you've toured the US with American manufacturers, consumers, workers, politicians, what do you think we will learn from that public comment period? And then I think peering into the looking glass based on your knowledge, what do you expect will happen with the tariffs? So let me begin um, by responding to something that's uh, baked into the background of your question before I get to the actual question about the four-year tariff review that's um, uh, underway. Um, you described the tariffs imposed on China and then the retaliatory tariffs uh, as part of a uh, confrontational program on trade uh, by the Trump administration vis-a-vis -vis China. And I think that all of those component parts are true except that I think that what you miss there is, I don't think that the reason for the imposition of those tariffs 
was simply to be confrontational. And I think it's really important um, in all policy areas, especially trade policy, um, to um, try to, um, um, to detach emotionally uh, from, uh, from, from some of these policies and from the history of some of these policies. The reason why uh, those tariffs were imposed was because uh, the Trump administration and the US trade representative um, for the Trump administration, Bob Lighthizer, initiated a section 301 investigation into China's um, uh, abusive intellectual property rights um, and forced tech transfer practices. I think that um, these have been longstanding and really um, commonly recognized challenges in terms of uh, doing business with China and economically engaging with China. So I just wanna call attention to that because it is actually an important part of this uh, statutory review of the tariffs, which is that the tariffs weren't just put down to be provocative and sensational, um, that um, they served a purpose and the purpose was uh, one to address an unfair trade practice. Uh, they are um, playing field leveling tools. And so um, when uh, we have started this uh, four-year statutory review, it's under the Section 301 Unfair Trade Statute. And um, we carry out this review if someone from the US economy asks us to continue the tariffs and it starts a process for us to open a notice and comment period uh, to examine the effectiveness of the tariffs. So to your specific question then, in terms of what we're going to expect to hear. I'm expecting to hear um, a diversity of views that reflect the diversity of the US economy and the US economic makeup. I expect to hear some businesses come to us and some stakeholders say, uh, we would really like some relief from these tariffs for the reasons that you've identified. Uh, I am expecting to hear from others to say, you know what, uh, we think that uh, you uh, and the previous administration have identified a challenge with respect to resiliency and the concentration of production and supply and our um, a challenging dependence that we have on um, the Chinese economy. And I am working hard to try to um, uh, develop uh, other options, but it can't happen overnight. So I'm gonna need some time. I'm expecting to hear that. I, I am also expecting, and this goes to the reason why we have started this uh, entire review, I am expecting to hear stakeholders from our economy say, please continue these tariffs. Maybe not all of them, but you know, it is incumbent on those stakeholders to identify for us which tariffs they want us to continue as part of a strategic rebalancing and playing field leveling between the two largest economies. So, so that's so that's a, it's a fantastic answer. And it, it does get to another, I think, sort of larger issue um, that is a, a fascinating tension in U.S.-China economic relations right now. So, you know, we just witnessed the Party Congress in China and what looked like a greater consolidation of power um, from Xi Jinping. And perhaps on that side, a more competitive and adversarial relationship with the United States. And on the U.S. side, Congress passed the CHIPS Act to catalyze our domestic semiconductor industry and use export controls to keep technology out of the hands of Chinese firms. And I, so in your role as USTR, like there, how do we balance these legitimate national security concerns um, with the needs of US businesses, especially those in the technology industry? I think that this is a really great question because it comes to the core of, um, uh, U.S. trade policy and how it's constructed within our constitution, uh, but also um, USTR's position um, on the U.S. government team, uh, which is that um, in terms of uh, um, where USTR sits, we sit at the intersection of two powerful uh, policy vectors, one of them being foreign policy, national security, the other one being domestic economic policy. That means being at that intersection always involves some level of discomfort because you're always trying to balance and find the balance between these two really important vectors. Um, in the examples that you've given, um, let, me, uh, let me tease out a little bit how, how I see this, and this is your question, which is um, at USTR, um, we have to be responsive to these different forces. 
within the government as well. But I think that, you know, when you talked about the export controls um, uh, action that was announced uh, in early October, that is definitely a national security measure. Um, and um, uh, it uh, is something that came from the Commerce Department, the Bureau of Industry, and uh, what does the S stand for? Do you remember? So it's, it's not standards, is it? Bureau of Industry and Security. There we go, because it's national security. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, 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 my commerce colleagues have been very clear with me and with others that those controls were narrowly targeted, very carefully targeted at certain technologies certain end uses, certain end users, um, and uh, are addressing um, a, a, a military application and concern and risk. Um, <clears throat> what we do at USTR most of the time is in this area of maybe economic security to um, economic terms of competition, economic engagement with a view towards building prosperity, and now especially building resilience. I want to articulate this set of principles in this structure because as a legal matter, as a policy and, a, and as a policy making disciplinary matter, uh, it is important for us as the United States, as a rule of law country, when we are imposing financial sanctions, export controls, uh, increasing tariffs or imposing uh, import bans on Russia as part of a sanctions program, that is a national security action. That is when some of our trade tools are being deployed for national security reasons. Um, but um, uh, most of the time, what we are doing is actually um, uh, in this kind of uh, um, uh, economic uh, competition and economic prosperity space. Um, I want to make this very, very clear because when you juxtapose this structure and there are legal authorities that track how we do this also. And you compare to um, how um, uh, Beijing responds, when Beijing responds to political decisions that have been taken by partners that it doesn't like, uh, when Beijing responds to um, um, uh, uh, other types of actions um, that um, we often don't see the distinction legal, principled or in the articulation uh, that distinguishes between national security for national security and economic tools for the rest of it. Um, so, you know, I, I think that uh, highlights um, one of the fundamental tensions that we have as, as economies and governments and systems, which is that in our system, there is a pretty, um, uh, in our concept, a pretty clear distinction between the state uh, and, and the economy. Uh, whereas I think for the Chinese system, you see an economy that is really infused by either a direct control or a constant influence by the state. And that creates all sorts of dilemmas when, it, did they do this for national security reasons? Did they do this for economic reasons? Did they do, right, did like, or did they do this for domestic control reasons? You never know in, in approaching the new policy. I, um, so... I have one last question for the ambassador. Actually, I have a lot more, but I, um, but I'm going to ask one more question. But while um, while I'm asking it and Ambassador Tai is answering it, we're setting up the mic. So while she's answering this last question, you can approach the mic and line up to ask your set of questions. Yeah, whatever you have to say. Um, so I want to talk about the WTO. Okay. Yeah. So you have been really vocal and, and I think very eloquent about saying that you want to make the WTO work better for Americans, mm -hmm. and. And I wanna sort of, if you could help us understand why isn't the WTO working for Americans and what reforms are necessary to fix it? And then I'm also interested in the constraints that you're facing in trying to take on that massive task. Sure, um, this is um, a blockbuster question. I could go on for hours, but I'm not <laughs> going to because in fact, nobody actually wants to hear me go on for hours about this. Um, uh, I care deeply about the WTO. And again, you know, um, I grew up in, uh, as a trade litigator litigating cases at the WTO. Uh, the WTO is a really important institution for everything that it stands for. In addition to the things that it continues to do and the things that it can do well. Um, it stands for a, um, a system of rules that is supposed to govern how economies and countries engage with each other um, uh, on, on economic issues. 
Um, and um, uh, as that, I think that, you know, it is there to um, uh, provide confidence um, to countries and to people and economic stakeholders um, that um, uh, the global economy is founded on something that is solid and fair. I think my concern is that um, the WTO isn't responsive right now to the lives, not just of ordinary Americans, but ordinary people. Um, this is not an ordinary audience, uh, but um, you know, if I ask all of you, uh, is the WTO relevant to you? Um, I'd be really curious to hear what your responses are, um, because I think that um, over time, um, the WTO itself is now almost 30 years old. Um, most of its rules and its structures were negotiated in the 1980s, more than 40 years ago, or 40 years ago, if my math correctly. And uh, the, the entire global economy is very different today than it was then. Um, I think that there has also been a significant erosion here at home, but also around the world, that the global economy doesn't function fairly. And I think that that is, um, you know, whether it's through the dispute settlement system, whether it's through the negotiation of new rules, whether it's in terms of the compliance and the amount of skin that the different uh, WTO economies have in the game, um, that uh, the, the WTO is there to provide confidence and fairness. And where there is eroded confidence and fairness, uh, we have got to lean in on a really robust uh, and comprehensive reform of an extremely important institution. Right. So I think with that, we can open it up to questions from the audience. I guess why don't we just go back and forth between the mics like this? Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Um, what do you think about carbon uh, border adjustments as a tool for protecting American workers while pursuing uh, climate change goals? So um, I would say that. Um, uh, being a new tool that we don't have right now, uh, but uh, being uh, something that uh, is being discussed and proposed as a way to do those two things. One is to uh, champion um, uh, standards of um, uh, fair trade and uh, worker standards and protections, and to create um, uh, an incentive system that will drive um, clean industrial production uh, through trade. Um, it is something that we absolutely need to engage on, uh, and um, it is a new tool uh, that we are very interested in exploring with our trading partners. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Tai, and I really appreciate your presence in here in Duke. And I have a question regarding to American trade policy, or, or it's a little bit like the history. Because we know that America have different protectionism in the past, for example, we have some conflict with um, the Great Britain. We have conflict with EU back then regarding to copper, and we have conflict with Japan regarding to the chip uh, problems, the industrial policy development. And right now we are having problems with China regarding to Chinese development, uh, including its unfair trade practices and lots of different structural problems regarding to subsidies. And I have a question is that, Sometimes these some of the barrier probably we set up also hurt our allies a lot. For example, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, it really makes, for example, American greatest allies, German and France, really, really struggle with all these subsidies. And when we really want to bar or, let's say, making slower of progress of Chinese chip industries, also force Japan and Netherlands you have a certain to limit their actions or trade normal trade activities with China it really hurt their economies. So my question is, how could the United States balance these a very, very, very difficult dilemma? And also with regarding to the domestic shareholders, for example, chip industries, 35%, most of them, 35% of their revenue came from China. So how could you address these problems more efficiently? Thank you. Great. Okay. So first, uh, as you identify all of the problems, um, you made me feel a little anxious, but then I had to remind myself, actually, my job is all about problems. And, and frankly, you know, in terms of trade, you can't just, you can't just do trade on your own. 
trade implies relationships. And, um, you know, I'm sure that you, like the rest of us, have many relationships in your life. And it is, I think, inherent in the nature of relationships that we have problems. We have tensions. Uh, we are all different from each other, but we have to engage with each other. So uh, trade is, in a way, um, uh, a, a discipline that is all about uh, relationship management and um, addressing tensions, uh, whether it's for f through a formal agreement and dispute settlement mechanism, or just in every day getting along. I would push back a little bit on you on two elements in your examples, but overall, I, 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 take, the, I take the overall um, question uh, and uh, frame as entirely legitimate, but I'm, I'm, gonna pick, I'm gonna pick at the details a little bit. On um, the export controls, again, you know, um, I'm 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 not the the authorized spokesperson on that, and and we are, but uh, I would invite you to uh, engage with um, the Commerce Department's articulation in terms of what exactly those export controls are intended to do, and and where the maybe the public narrative has has um, uh, has veered away from uh, the Commerce Department's uh, very technical and targeted uh, articulation. Uh, similarly, I think on the Inflation Reduction Act, in terms of um, where we are trying to address concerns that we are hearing from uh, some of our closest allies, again, uh, we are doing those types of things. But uh, again, I think that the public discourse has really gotten away from us. The Inflation Reduction Act, let's just center ourselves, is the greatest single investment the United States has ever made in clean technology and our contribution to uh, uh, addressing the climate crisis. Those are things that um, the countries in the rest of the world, but also these um, strategic partners and allies are completely aligned with us on. That doesn't mean that there can't be concerns or there aren't going to be concerns. Uh, we are engaged in a process to talk through those concerns. Um, I think that um, what I would say is, uh, I'm gonna take a issue also with one word that you've used around protectionism. I think that we have definitely seen protectionism in the past, but I, I just wanna focus on where we are today, describing it as a clash between this dichotomy of free trade and protectionism. I think it really does a disservice to the types of challenges that we are encountering and the kind of nuance certainly that we, the US government, but, but many other governments are trying to bring um, we are not trying to simply grab pieces of the pie for ourselves. We're trying to figure out how to, uh, how to responsibly address the many challenges that we're facing right now, continue to trade and be connected with our partners, but adapt to doing it in a new way. And I think because these things that we are trying to do uh, are new, we're going to encounter what I would describe as growing pains. And I think that that is a lot of what we are encountering right now, um, but that's the whole point of the matter. And it's working through those growing pains, I am convinced will help us to develop a set of principles that will serve um, the goals of developing a more resilient uh, global economy and restoring confidence to that economy and also to the fairness of that economy. Thank you, Jeff. Hello, um, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I hope you'll indulge me with another question about China. Um, so I'm writing my thesis about the triangular relationship between China and Taiwan and the US. Um, so my question is about that. Uh, we saw as of just a few days ago, the US and Taiwan agreed to in-person trade talks, but then we also see that Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan um, a few months ago prompted outrage from China in the form of quite a bit of belligerency that some people are calling the fourth Taiwan Strait crisis. And yet China and Taiwan are incredibly dependent on each other for trade. And so my question for you is, what is the US's role in, in navigating that relationship? And do you think that our trade networks and our relationships with both the PRC and Taiwan independent of each other can be used as a mitigating factor? Um. Great question uh, with a lot of complexity in it. Um, and I'm going to, I think I'm going to commit the sin of um, uh, reducing it a bit unfairly. Um, but I think what I would say is, um, you know, the US China relationship um, is profoundly consequential for 
us, for the two largest economies in the world, but for the entire world be because of the, the size and the, the, the positions that we have in the global economy. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the initiative that we have announced with Taiwan, uh, that is um, a part of a project that is tailored to our particular relationship. I think um, the last time uh, I checked the stats, uh, I think that Taiwan is now um, our eighth largest trading partner. So also a significant relationship. So what I'm really going to do is take your triangle and you know take it, like, take a very U.S. centered um, response um, in terms of these two bilateral relationships, um, and they present different sets of challenges and opportunities. And I think that we are very very committed to uh, working with both partners. Uh, in appropriate ways on uh, managing those relationships, whether that means to realize the potential and opportunity, or on the other side, to try to manage uh, the significant challenges that we have and um, uh, try to develop a vision for uh, where we are trying to go and, and how we can coexist in this global economy better. Thank you so much for being with us. Are you happy for me to continue? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I was just going to ask a question. It's kind of linked to, to the Indo-Pacific trade uh, economic framework, but basically around this fact that in recent years, especially since COVID, we've seen more authorita uh, authoritarian backsliding and just um, just different, I guess, approaches um, politically in, in specifically in Southeast Asia, but, but around the world globally. Um, and I was wondering how that has affected your negotiations, either of the Indo-Pacific framework or other um, similar negotiations you're engaged with right now with some of those countries in that region or, or even more globally, um, whether you've seen that impact or not? Um, given the specific uh, um, emphasis in your question on Southeast Asia, I almost want to pass this question to you. Um, <laughs> I don't have to do the negotiations. I just get to, I get to you know, sit back and write about it. No, no. And I'd love to discuss this more. I think it's a really, really interesting question. I guess, again, you know, um, I guess this is what I would say, which is um, we have a lot of trading partners with whom um, uh, we share a lot in terms of the structure of our systems, our political philosophies, um, the uh, histories and the structures of our economies. And then we also have trading partners with whom we share fewer of those things. Uh, back to the earlier question, I think, you know, in order to be engaged in the world, um, we've got to figure out how we can appropriately and responsibly uh, manage uh, all of those different types of relationships. Um, so uh, there's not a particularly deep answer to your question, and I, I, I will definitely take some time to think about it some more, but uh, for sure, there are particular challenges with being a democracy. And I will be very honest about it, that um, democracies are hard, uh, they're messy, and uh, they're super transparent, and there's not a lot you can hide. All you can do is be honest about um, uh, the challenges. But um, uh, for us, uh, there are important virtues to uh, this democracy, and we fight for it every single day. We fight for democracy internationally, and we fight for democracy here at home. And I think that um, in terms of our interactions with our different partners, uh, that there is and there should be a particular understanding uh, between um, uh, democratic economic partners in terms of the challenges, but also the incredible virtues of our systems. And when we are working with um, partners that have a different system um, uh, and a different set of values, um, that does make things harder. And I think we have to be a lot more thoughtful about how we engage. We want to take the last four questions together, and then that way I'll, I can paste the answers and try to. Yeah, sure. That okay. sounds great. Let's do it that way. So we'll just we'll just take them all four in sort of like a murderer's row, and then we'll yeah, and then. <laughs> um, sweet. So in light of things like the BRICS agreement and this seeming skepticism within China and India, particularly around the current um, sort of world order when it comes to trade, how does the US assess the potential risks to the WTO as sort of the main organization governing trade? And how does it understand trade moving forward if that skepticism continues to increase within emerging economies? Um. My question is more just following the questions about China, the relationship with China. Uh, two questions. One is that based on your assessment at this point, how do, do you think the Trump tariff has been effective? And the second question is that 
there's a, there's one view because of the tariff, and we actually become more like China in terms of government subsidy through the cheap acts and inflation acts and all the uh, government um, industrial policy U.S. is implementing. I think more second point is more related to your office because your office wields tremendous power in deciding waiver or not on certain tariffs. So is that taken away from our free market economy? Thank you. I'll make mine very quick. Um, can you talk a little bit, since you worked in both the executive and legislative branches, about the political calculus behind reauthorizing Trade Promotion Authority and whether you think it's necessary for you to do your job? I'll also make my question brief um, <clears throat> and somewhat specific. So you mentioned the CHIPS Act, and I was wondering, that's sort of an internal focus on semiconductors, and it sort of focuses on the issues of semiconductors from a domestic perspective. Um, and I was wondering if you could compare that to the 1986 U.S.-Japan uh, semiconductor agreement and how that was more of an external focus on semiconductors and just the effectiveness of those different approaches with that type of technology. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, you so took notes. So I've got them. Yeah. So we've okay. got BRICS and WTO skepticism. Okay. okay. Let me let me take that one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So on BRICS and WTO skepticism, your concern is well, you know, um, if if you start to see more and more countries and major economies around the world um, expressing concern about the WTO, or we concerned that the WTO will just go away and like everything that it stands for um, dissolves, and um, I guess I would come at it a different way, which is um, every time I every time I encounter um, a, a fellow WTO member express concerns about the WTO, um, <clears throat> I see it as an opportunity because we also have our concerns about the WTO and we have fully endorsed a WTO reform program. And so when we have our partners also articulating their concerns, whether it's framed as a skepticism or a complaint about how being a member of the WTO uh, hasn't served uh, their interests or hasn't helped to realize the opportunity that they need to realize for their economies and the people. I see that as an opportunity for us to engage on a vision for, well, what is the WTO that is going to do that for you? It's, it's probably what needs to change. And it only if we can have that conversation can we can we build towards that vision? So uh, my answer to you in particular, and uh, you know, especially from that set of partners, really important parts of the global economy, to the extent that we can engage on those issues, that is a plus. That's great. Um, the second one is the effectiveness of the Trump tariffs on their stated goals and whether the Trump tariffs have made us more like China. Um, I think you know how I'm going to answer this question, right? <laughs> so I feel like it's a bit of a setup. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay. Um, you know, and I think I will take up my answer for this question along with the semiconductors question. Okay. Um, and and I'm going to do a little bit of a, a shift on, you know, um, the inside outside game for semiconductors and just say, um, you know, the um, the Chips and Science Act was, and you mentioned this also in, in your question too, uh, again, uh, an important investment in research development, uh, the supply chain for um, the future of, of chips uh, and um, the U.S. investing in it, doing something quite unusual for us, which looks like industrial policy. I fully agree. It looks like industrial policy. So, you know, are the pressures that we are experiencing from China making us more like China. And I wanna really challenge that because I think that um, uh, one might be tempted to say yes, but in reality, what is happening right now is I think that uh, the scales have fallen from our eyes consistently across the economy in terms of um, <clears throat> the kinds of uh, uh, dependencies that we have developed through this version of globalization and uh, really kind of an unhealthy sense of vulnerability and anxiety in the global economy and especially between the US and the Chinese economies. Um, <clears throat> in response to the pressures that we see in terms of competition coming from Chinese economic policies, and, and I won't even get into whether or not I think it is the goal of Chinese economic policies to make us feel pressured and threatened. I just think, let's just start with, that is the effect for sure. And where we see um, China leaning in on industrial um, uh, ambitions, where they have been very effective in um, building up um, steel production, 
to a point where they produce more steel, they can produce more steel, their capacity uh, is to produce more steel than they themselves could use, then probably, you know, um, uh, uh, demand in the world requires um, that uh, we find ourselves struggling to um, maintain a productive, vibrant steel industry, which is important for us for industrial and, and also national security reasons. Um, on, um, on solar panels is another example of a sector where um, a, a, a very focused and concerted Chinese strategy has meant that a burgeoning sector that we had here in the United States and Canada and Germany 15, 20 years ago, we no longer have. That 85% of world production is happening in China and that has created another dependency that is very uncomfortable for us that has ended up pitting us against ourselves and our closest partners to try to redevelop that capacity. What that means is we have got to up our game. We've got to be able to respond in a way that um, follows certain principles, but is maybe fundamentally somewhat defensive in nature, responsive in nature. Because if we don't change our game, I think that semiconductors, um, uh, electric vehicles, uh, other renewable energy um, uh, uh, sectors, are all going to go the way of steel and solar. Um, and um, that's not a good place for us to be, and it's not a good place for the world economy to be. So, you know, whether it's through the planning, the strategy, subsidies, or the tariffs, uh, essentially what we are doing right now is trying to find a responsive way to realign uh, and um, uh, to, to safeguard a space for economies like ours to continue to be able to produce, um, uh, survive and thrive. And I think that that on semiconductors was the point that I wanted to make, which is um, uh, was really impressive throwing out there the 1986 uh, agreement that we had with Japan. Um, I think that's right. I think that we are trying to bring a different game uh, with respect of a very different kind of competitive challenge. So I think I took care of question number four also, which that, leaves question number That was great. And so the, the the last one, which was I think is a really interesting question, one that I would love to ask you too, is given your unique experience in both the legislative and the executive branches on the trade promotion authority renewal. And you know, would this make your job easier? <laughs> um, I have so many thoughts on this as well. Um, in, in my view, uh, the trade promotion authority, well, let's just go back to um, trade authority. So um, the authority for foreign commerce in our constitution is given to um, the article one branch of government, which is the legislature. The authority for foreign affairs, which is to represent the United States with one voice um, in, in terms of uh, the rest of the world is given to article two, which is the executive. Speaking of sitting at intersections, USTR sits at the intersection of these two branches and these two constitutional authorities. So, when we do trade negotiations, trade policy, it's about um, uh, balancing those authorities between um, legislative, foreign commerce, and foreign affairs. Um, trade promotion authority, in my mind, when you unpack what it is, um, is, um, is really very, a very explicit version of a deal between the executive branch and the congressional branch around um, trade agreements in particular. And it's a set of, you know, well, I'll do this if you do that for me. Um, they're around procedural protections. They're around um, consultative processes. Um, I, just want to, I just want to observe that traditionally, trade promotion authority legislation has not been particularly robustly bipartisan. And our goal, in the Biden administration is to advance trade policy that is robustly supported. And that is bipartisan, but also robustly supported across the sectors of our economy. And so uh, in my view, uh, that is um, critical to the durability of uh, not just our trade policies, but our leadership in the world. Um, and um, uh, that guides my thinking around Trade promotion authority, but also everything else that we are doing, which is I'm putting a premium on bipartisanship. And I'm going to do a little bit of putting this back on the US Congress to say, show me the money, show me a version of a broadly bipartisan TPA. 
Um, and that is the vision that I'm looking for. And if there's not a vision for that, then um, I, I would rather spend my time uh, working uh, that um, uh, congressional executive partnership that is always there to develop and advance trade policies that are going to be durable and most so that is a fantastic question to end on in terms of embracing um, embracing bipartisanship and embracing the diversity of interests in the U.S. when it comes to trade authority. Um, Investor Tai, uh, you know, thank you so much. I, I have learned so much from this conversation. Um, I plan to introduce many of these ideas into my political risk analysis class next semester. So it was really great to learn from you. Everyone, please join me in thanking and congratulating Ambassador Tai. Thank you. Let's see.